Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the fifth and final session of the Autumn 2022 um, Sonokesis Digital Classics program. Um, this, um, this session um, is a, a slightly new topic to, to Sonokesis. We'll be talking about using and editing wiki, wiki data. Uh, we've talked about Wikipedia in the past and other other parts of the um, the Wikimedia universe, um, but but looking looking really in, in a bit more depth at the, um, the the linked open data spine of all of these different Wikimedia um, um, projects, um, I think is going to be really really quite exciting. Um, and so the the main um, uh, information today is going to be given to us by um, uh, two two of our colleagues, and um, one is Shani Evenstein Sigalov. Um, who um, I think this is her first visit to Synergesis Digital Classics, certainly not her last, um, and the other Monica Berti, who I think you may have met and heard of before, um, the, the co-organizer. A um, couple of quick notes to those of you watching live. Um, please feel free to drop any questions or comments in the live chat feature, which should be to the right of the video or below the video, depending on your, um, your setup. Um, and you can also join the discussion and make um, comments at the end and with that and we'll, we'll respond to those um, uh, when, we, when we come to them. Um, if you're watching this uh, later, this, this video remains available um, at the same address on YouTube. If you're watching later, obviously you can't, you can't ask live questions, but, but we're also always very happy for you to get in touch if you have any questions. Um, if you've come to this directly through YouTube or through some other link, there is a link to the session page which has more information um, and resources um, linked below this video on, on YouTube. So please feel free to use that. The, um, the content is, um, is open licensed and the idea is that people are free to use this in their own teaching and learning um, at will. Um, so with that introduction out of the way, um, I think Shani is starting us off and I'll, I'll hand over to her right now. Uh, you're still muted, Shani. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, this is a topic I'm fairly uh, passionate about, so a, a great opportunity to kind of share and spread the, the, the wiki love, as we say. And I'll just start presenting and we'll, we'll delve into it. So this is us. Um, Monica, Gabby and, and myself are doing this. I am just for context, an educator, lecturer, researcher and free knowledge advocate. I'm uh, working at Tel Aviv University and also affiliated with uh, the School of Advanced Study at the University of London, the uh, Digital Humanities Research Lab. And um, again, very excited to present Wikidata. This, is, uh, this session is specifically for beginners, so you don't need to know anything. We don't assume that you know, and do feel free to ask us questions. And Monica and Gabby will help uh, tell me uh, when you do, because I can see right now all the all the comments. So, what did I? Um, what did we uh, have for you for today? We're going to begin with a gentle introduction to Wikidata. Then, um, parts two and three, we're going to show um, how we can extract and uh, data from Wikidata and visualize it, and also give you some examples of existing uses. Um, projects from around the world that will give you some inspiration. And in the last half hour, we're going to sum it up and have an open Q&A. So let's delve into it. A short, short-ish introduction to Wikidata. So I like to open any discussion on Wikidata, just reminding people where we are at, right? In today's world, it's very difficult to talk about data or big data uh, or progress without hearing about any AI, right? Artificial intelligence and the, the growing field of data science. But all of that is not possible, not big data, data science and AI is not possible without actual data. And this is why in a sense, Wikidata is such an important piece of the puzzle uh, of this ecosystem and what is Wikidata in essence? It is a one of, um, it's a sister project of Wikipedia, which I'm sure you know. Wikipedia um, actually has 13 sister projects. It's all part of the Wikimedia movement and Wikimedia ecosystem. This project was launched in 2012, and it is essentially a database of what we call structured linked data. 
and it is multilingual, unlike Wikipedia, right, which you all know. And it is one of the key features is that it's read both by humans and machines. And it's open for everyone under a free license. And this is one of the biggest things that separate it from other big data uh, uh, knowledge bases or databases or knowledge graphs sometimes that they call it. So uh, this is in essence this project. But first things first, um, I think you know by now that Wikidata exists, but really what does it mean that it's a knowledge base of structured linked data? Mm -hmm. And to give you that context really briefly, I wanted to show this person, uh, which I'm sure some of you probably recognize. This is uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the person uh, who is responsible for the World Wide Web, right? Not to be mixed with the internet. I love this picture. And Tim Berners-Lee had a vision. And as early as, I think it was 94, 1994, but really in 20, 2001, he starts to speak about a semantic web. He actually writes a paper called The Road to Semantic Web. And he describes this world where we don't only share, as we know in, in Web 2.0, we have all sorts of websites that enabled us at the beginning of the 20th, uh, 2000s to, to start uh, sharing information, right? Connecting all the social media websites. Actually, most of the websites that we all know today are called Web2 websites. And he starts to, as, as early as that begins to happen in, in the web, um, you know, websites like Wikipedia and like... Um, um, actually, any blogs or or Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, ma mainly all the main websites that you work with today are web too. And he starts to imagine something else. He calls it the semantic web. It's part of a new version of the web. Sometimes it's called web three. By the way, not to be confused with web three, um, as they call it in the past few years in, in relation to crypto. So not that, it actually exists in the literature much earlier. And as part of this web three, the, the 3.0 version of the web, we, some, we suddenly are able to connect to data. So he describes a world where there's a, an ability to approach data and question it and query it, not only humans, but also machines. And since he describes this, this vision for the semantic web, humanity has been trying to really realize this dream without really succeeding, not on a scale, until uh, really Wikidata happens. So sometimes it's called Web3, sometimes it's called the semantic web, sometimes it's called linked data. Essentially, um, in the literature, you'll find different um, explanations and different um, definitions for each of these, but essentially they're all talking about the same thing. So we want, now that you know that there has been an evolution of the web, sort of, and there has been a dream to have a an ecosystem of data so we can, as humanity, actually begin to make sense of all the enormous amounts of data that are out there, um, Wikidata is born. And I wanted to give some context specifically from things that you know on Wikipedia to why it actually happened. So when Wikidata uh, started in 2012, really the people who developed it wanted to answer one thing. They wanted to have a list of all the women mayors um, of the 10 biggest cities in the world. And they wanted to get a, li a specific list. And to see it according to the um, to, to which city is the biggest, right? So a ranked list of women mayors. Now think for a second about Google search, right? And web two and how we all search for information on a daily basis. And what will you get if you ask Google that? Well, today you'll already get a list, but um, 10 years ago, before Wikidata was, was founded, when you looked for that, um, let's say you 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 wrote in the in the in the search, women uh, mayors cities, you will get thousands and thousands of websites that have these words in them, 
but you won't get a specific list. What linked data and what having a, a, data, a database, a knowledge base of structured linked data allows you to do is to query it and receive these specific pieces of information that you're looking for. So they wanted to answer that, and this is actually the thing that prompted the, the development of Wikidata. But I wanted to give a bit, a bit of a, um, a broader um, explanation of the actual need. So Wikipedia, um, which started in 2011, that one of the frustrating things is that most of this knowledge, right, of let's say the, the women mayors in, in various cities in the world, it exists in Wikipedia, right? It floats somewhere in Wikipedia, but it's impossible to get it. Now, let's say that you ha we, have, we do have categories in Wikipedia. So essentially we could have had a category, but categories, although really great, they are limited in the way that we can query them. We can ask questions only to what's in the category, but let's say that uh, you have, you're really interested, let's say in women authors in, uh, or women painters. If the moment that you want to say, okay, I want women painters and there, there may be a category for that. But if you want those who were born in Italy between, I don't know, 1927 uh, to 1950, because that's the period that you're researching, then categories will not allow you to do it. So we have one issue or one need that prompted Wikidata was this inflexible way to, to query the knowledge that is inside Wikipedia, which is frustrating, right? Because we know it's there, we just can't access it easily. The, the first point, which I skipped because I uh, jumped into the categories, but I want to go back to it, is data itself and repetitive work that volunteers around the world need to do on Wikipedia. So as some of you may know, Wikipedia exists in over 300 languages. That before we had Wikidata, what that meant is that let's say that a celebrity passes away, right? That moment, a person in the English Wikipedia, if it's a well-known person, would go to the English Wikipedia to change the, the death date, right? Essentially, we will have to do the same job of correcting that date in 300 languages. What that creates is differences between different languages. Data is sometimes outdated. It would be at times because it doesn't have to be necessarily some celebrity, right? Let's say that someone um, is updating the mayor of the city where they live. Now, if it's a small place, let's say, I don't know, in France, probably the French Wikipedians living ne near would update the French Wikipedia, but it will take time for this knowledge, for this data to be updated in other languages that this information may be less relevant. So it creates imbalances of the data that we show in different languages. Now, the third point or the third need of why all of this was created was that humanity has been wanting for a long time to have some sort of central hub. Um, now, if you like me, like art and um, a history and stuff like that, then, and you know something about museums and archives, what we call here GLAMS, it's, a, uh, it's an acronym for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums um, that we use in, in the Wikimedia movement and actually beyond it these days, then, GLAMs usually have metadata for every artifact that they have in their collection. For example, for a book in a library, you'll have all the data about the book, like who's the author, when was it uh, printed, uh, what's, uh, how many pages, etc., etc. All this metadata, the problem is that we all have the idea, that humanity had the idea of having this one place, one website that can show all the books in the world. How amazing would that be? Or an online place where we can go to see all the museums, all the, the artifacts from all the museums in the world. Now, there have been various attempts to, to get there, but it's very difficult because if you know uh, something about uh, GLAMS, then you know that there is no unified universal standard for metadata. So in essence, every institution writes the metadata in a different way. 
So any time that humanity tried to merge these, these data from different sources, it was very difficult and didn't really work well. So that was another need that we, that we had. That, and of course, Tim Berners-Lee's and, and his vision of the semantic web that was floating around. So all of these essentially um, brought us to a point where we wanted to develop one data set that will answer all these different needs. And this is exactly what Wikidata is doing. To date, it is the largest um, knowledge base repository of data uh, that humanity has created. It has over 100 million items. It just, by the way, celebrated its 10th anniversary just, a just on October and um, moved over the threshold of the 100 million items, which is quite amazing. And um, the, the, this knowledge base is growing exponentially, so it keeps growing and growing. And um, we'll see how it looks like in, in a second. But I did want to say that um, I didn't mention, but my PhD research is about Wikidata as a learning platform and how we can use it and how it changes the interaction between humans and knowledge. And one of the things that I've ex, um, explored in my, in my research is what types of even interactions we have with it. So a bit similarly to Wikipedia, there are two main things that we'll discuss later today that I can mention now, and that is data curation and data extraction. What, what do I mean by data curation? So anytime that I add information or add data to Wikidata, I call it data curation. The other side of it, a bit like creating a, a, an article in Wikipedia, right? Um, the other side of it is extracting the information from the knowledge base. That's actually in, in Wikipedia, it's the easiest part. It's what most of you do, right? We just consume information. We read uh, existing articles and use the information to, to whatever we need. Extraction information from Wikidata is more complex. It requires knowing a the querying language that is called Sparkle. But basically, this process of answering specific questions that we have, querying this database and getting information, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, is called data extraction. We also have two other interactions that I'll note, but we're not really going to delve uh, too much into, maybe just mention later on. And that is data creation or auto-generating content based on data that is already on Wikidata. I'll show an example of that. And also a different interaction is actually using it like we're doing now a bit, um, both for teaching and research. So these are the main interactions we have with the platform. And without further ado, I've talked too, so, so much about it. I want to show you how it looks like. So let's go to see how Wikidata looks like. And I'll go out of my slides for a second and I'll go into Wikidata. And I'll just ask you to tell me that you still see my, my screen. Yes, we do. Perfect. So this is Wikidata. Tell me if it's too small and I need to enlarge. That's about right, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. So welcome to Wikidata. This is how it looks like. It reminds you probably a bit of Wikipedia from, from uh, what you know. There's uh, some sort of menu on the left and there's some sort of menu on the right. I'm at the moment logged in, but um, everything I see, I'll log out for a second, just that you see that everything that I see, you can also see. Oh, it doesn't want to log out. Just a second. Yes, and let's go to the main page. So this is what you see, even if you didn't log in. And uh, we've all encouraged you before this session to actually uh, create, an, um, create an account if you don't have a wiki account already. So you can um, actually join our page for this um, session and we can continue to follow what you're doing, etc. So we'll talk about that uh, closer to the end. But just to mention, this is what everyone see. You don't have to be logged in and you can explore it even without being um, a user in the system. So when you go into Wikidata, it will basically tell you that this is the this is Wikidata. It has over 100 um, thousand um, um, items at the moment and uh, let's go to see one of them and what I didn't mention until now is that every item in the system 
has its own number. These Q numbers help us differentiate between different items. And I just want to briefly show you how an item looks like on Wikidata. So when we go into um, an item, this is the item for Douglas Adams. Those who actually read his um, books can appreciate why the number that it got in the system is 42. And if you haven't read it, go read uh, Douglas Adams because he's hilarious and, and brilliant. And at the entrance, what you'll see is the different labels, right? So this item, this Q42, we can express what it is in different languages. And this is the really important part of Wikidata that is it's multilingual. Now, notice that the languages I see uh, without logging in are English, Hebrew, and Arabic. And this is because uh, I'm right now in Israel and um, Wikidata identifies that my IP is coming from this area of the world. So it's showing me the um, relevant languages to my area. Once you log in, you can actually um, choose your own languages that you know. Uh, so you can actually control what you see here. But I can also click here. I won't right now, but I can essentially click here to see other languages. And you'll see that the, the, the important feature which helps machines read it is that the item here also in, the, in this line shows us that it's a Q42. Now in English, it would be described like this, in Hebrew letters like this, in Arabic collector like this. There's also a description and uh, aliases or also known as in, like other names where we can identify the person. And the description is really important because it helps us differentiate between different people with the same name, which exists a lot. After that, we get to the statements and this is essentially the part of the structure linked data or open, open um, or in this case, it's open linked data. But the idea in whenever we talk about the semantic web or about linked data is that we have triples of information. Um, so the first portion is that Douglas Adams and then we'll have statements that says that uh, the inst it's an instance of a human, right? So we'll have some kind of property and some kind of value to that property, almost like a form that you're filling out, right? And these are triples in the systems. And the fact that it's structured will allow me later on to query specific things. And in terms of statements, so we'll see an image and we can ask uh, what the sex or gender is, the citizenship, languages, birth name, uh, birth date, etc. All of these details about that person um, in a structured way, even is his grave, his father, siblings, children, etc. occupation. And you can see here that every uh, property can have multiple values, right? Which is really important. And also it can have references, which is again, essential and we'll touch upon it later on. But a good item on Wikidata would be an item where we have references to where that information comes from. Um, one more thing that is unique to Wikidata compared to other um, semantic web platforms is that um, some of the statements, some of the values can have like additional information. So for, for um, specifically here, let's look at the educated at. We know that he was educated at St. John's College, but then there would be a set of things that we would want to know about it. These are qualifiers and they're they are helping us I, um, give more details about this specific statement. For instance, when he started and when he ended his time there, what was the academic major, et cetera, et cetera. So we have properties, we have um, item numbers, so Q numbers, um, like we saw at the beginning, there are the values, which can be either a number or another Q number. And the important portion that I wanted to show you that we've discussed before is identifiers. So this is another set of statements in this item. The, but these are unique statements because what they're doing, they're connecting different databases, external databases into one place. For instance, the VF number um, for Douglas Adams in their own database, that's the number. If I click on it, um, I'll click on it here. 
because I have too many tabs open. Um, we have jumped into, actually into VF, and we can see the item on Douglas Adams in VF, which is amazing, right? So for the first time, or we can do it in the uh, French uh, library or in, in, other, um, in other databases that are external. So for the first time, Wikidata is allowing us to kind of connect different items that, are, that have a, a serial number in specific external databases into one place, into one hub. This is very important. At the end of the item, by the way, because it goes on and on, we'll find all the different Wikipedia languages that have an actual article on Douglas Adams. This is what allows us to see the list when we go to Wikipedia. This is what allows you to, uh, to see the list of languages um, that you usually see on the, depending on the language, right? But uh, below or now up if because they changed the, the scheme. Um, but you can also see additional information in Wikiquote and, and other Wiki projects. If they have additional data on Douglas Adams, you'll see it here. So this is essentially an item on Wikidata. And I want to pause here and ask Monica to showcase some example that are some examples that are relevant to your uh, discipline. Monica? Yes, thank you. Uh, Shani, thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. So now um, I will show you a few examples related to the classical world. Uh, and uh, you can find the links in our class outline in uh, GitHub. And as you can see in my screen, so we have uh, four examples here two ancient authors and then two scholars who work about uh, classical antiquity. And uh, in GitHub, you have the four links to Wikidata. But one thing I would like to mention before, so we have four examples, for example, Herodotus. And if you look for Herodotus in Wikipedia, of course, you, uh, you have the page in Wikipedia, and you can, in any case, find the Wikidata item here on the left, and uh, you can jump to the page in, um, in Wikidata. And Shani um, has just shown us the structure of a Wikidata uh, item, and I will go back to this. But I would like just to mention the importance of uh, this data and this uh, structure for our work in classics and in digital classics, because if in Wikipedia, we find information, for example, about Herodotus. Uh, in uh, uh, Wikidata, we have this uh, uh, knowledge base. We have this uh, structure where we can um, get uh, pieces of data which can be important for our work. For example, I can mention my work. I'm interested in getting um, forms in ancient Greek, not only information about uh, uh, a specific uh, author like Herodotus, like names in various uh, modern and contemporary languages or other metadata, including uh, the chronology, but also, uh, for example, the name of the author in the uh, original language, including um, other elements like Herodotus, Alicarnaseus, for example, name in a native language, which is an interesting thing. And there are also, of course, other uh, metadata, but I will go back to, um, to this. Uh, and... Uh, um, we have, as I said, we have uh, uh, four examples. So the first uh, is um, Alexander of Aphrodisias, so um, the, the philosopher, the th second, third century Greek philosopher, Herodotus. Uh, then uh, we have chosen uh, another uh, entry about Felix Jacobi, the German historian, the uh, editor of the big collection of Greek fragmentary historians, and then Ernest Mayer, um, a German historian of classical antiquity. In this case, this entry is interesting because uh, we have, as you can see here, uh, data and metadata in English, but in Wikipedia we have only the German entry. So we have we don't have entries uh, uh, in other languages for these uh, uh, for these scholar. But uh, going back so to the first uh, uh, example, for I can still use uh, uh, Herodotus. Um, 
we, we find, of course, uh, uh, we have here um, the structure and Shani was showing before, we have, first of all, of course, the name of uh, uh, the author in different languages and different statements, which are very important for us, starting from generic statements, but this is what, what we need, of course. First is human, is a male, then we, we can also have other um, uh, data and metadata, for example, we can have images, uh, etc. Then we have um, forms in, uh, in, in the native language, in this case, ancient Greek, the given name uh, used today, this is the for the Latin, or at least, um, yes, the, the the, the transliterated form, then we have uh, the chronology, which is a something uh, complex for ancient authors. In this case, we have dates for Herodotus, but there are other authors, including Alexander of Aphrodisias, where we don't have specific dates for the date of birth and the date of death, which is a bit complex for, uh, for historians. Then we have, of course, other interesting um, data like the place of death when we have it. And uh, of course, we can have for an ancient author other places where an author was born when we know this uh, information, because of course, for ancient authors, we have a lot of missing uh, data. Um, the place of birth, if possible, languages, writing language, uh, in this case, ancient Greek, but we can have more languages for also for an ancient author. Occupation, which is, of course, um, uh, I mean, uh, um, a modern uh, term, but of course, here, as we can see for Herodotus, for example, we have uh, interesting uh, pieces of data like historian, definitely a politician, he was involved in, uh, in politics, writer, of course, we could add other other, let's say, um, terms to refer to the occupation of, uh, uh, of Herodotus' residence, etc. So I, I'm not here now to, uh, to of course, uh, to, to read um, the entire um, uh, list of this metadata, but uh, really uh, Wikidata allows to uh, add a lot of information about, in this case, the ancient author. Then we have the possibility, of course, to include uh, uh, sources, in this case, not ancient sources, but modern sources where we find uh, information about an ancient author. And then uh, finally, uh, we also have, and I have to go down, identifiers, which are definitely very important for us because we have, let's say, links to external resources where we uh, get um, other information about the author. Um, VF, well, the Virtual International Authority file was mentioned before by Shani. And for example, for ancient uh, uh, Greek and for ancient Greek literature, we have important uh, um, identifiers like the TLG, and I can uh, look for it uh, here. So we can we have the TLG author ID. This number is very important for us. Uh, this is a reference resource. In this case, uh, we have a link to the Thesaurus Lingua Graeca and also to, um, Pers to the Perseus uh, catalog where uh, we have the author ID. And uh, through this, we can go to the Perseus catalog and get even more uh, metadata about this historian uh, and more uh, resources. So just to show a few examples. But uh, going back to, um, to Wikidata, uh, what we want to show uh, is another related resource, uh, which is um, Resonator. And uh, I'm uh, um, um, showing here uh, the main page of this resource. Um, because this is a, a wonderful, uh, we could, uh, as you can see, as you can read here. So um, Wikidata is an amazing project, but a bit rather dry. Um, and so the idea, of course, is to have a, a resource, which is a resonator, um, where you have not only okay, uh, the display of Wikidata entries, but also an item type optimized fashion. Um, and uh, 
as you can see, um, we can understand maybe uh, what <laughs> um, we mean by dry. Of course, uh, in, this, uh, um, in this page where we have an entry of uh, Wikidata, uh, you have, uh, yes, uh, these, uh, uh, let's say, um, list uh, of uh, um, various uh, statements about uh, um, a specific author. In Resonator, we can see the same information, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a different way, uh, not dry, as uh, is written in, um, okay, uh, in the main page of Resonator. And here we, we can see the page about Herodotus. So uh, just to, uh, to show you where you can get Resonator, so when you have your uh, Herodotus entry in, in Wikidata, you can get uh, the link to Resonator here on the left. Uh, you have to be logged in to get it, and then you can uh, find uh, your, uh, you can get uh, the corresponding uh, entry in uh, Resonator. Uh, and uh, um, as you can see, so the, the page is a bit different, um, and we uh, have uh, uh, this data, so for example, the list, this uh, list of uh, um, the name of the author in different languages is just below the name of the author. This number is fundamental because this is the Wikidata ID that you can use in different resources to get the wiki to get a link to, to, to the Wikidata entry. So this is the unique identifiers. This is very important. And then, of course, you have the metadata that I was uh, talking about before, like the, let's say, occupation, Greek historian and geographer. We can see that here we get more information because in this case we have uh, not just historian, uh, writer, but we have a, a specific, uh, um, more specific information. So Greek historian and geographer also. And then we have the, the chronology in this case uh, with the, 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 the seas of Circa. So to, 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 to remember that uh, ancient uh, um, chronologies are not so fixed as uh, today. Uh, and then, um, and here we find, of course, the Wikidata um, metadata for the occupation. And then uh, below we have um, other, um, let's say, a metadata about uh, sources, uh, and then we can find again the name in the native language, uh, etc. And then on the right you have uh, a list, uh, a very rich list of external uh, resources. Um, um, I don't know. Um, I don't see, um, of course, my colleagues in in uh, stream here. So please interrupt me if you want to add uh, something uh, while I'm showing these uh, these entries. So this is uh, uh, the entry about Herodotus. Then we show we we have another um, example, uh, another ancient author. Uh, the Greek philosopher Alexander of Aphrodisias. Um, again, um, also in this case, uh, we can see the difference between the Wikidata entry and Resonator. Um, and Monica, maybe just to mention yeah. for people, that yeah. in order to get to Resonator, they need to log in, go to the preferences, and then click on gadgets and, and choose to see Resonator. And once yes. they do it, um, so click on the icon of the person that is hiding. Yes, preferences. Yes. Let's just show that so people can activate it. Above, you need to click on the gadget tab. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. I, I go to the gadgets. Okay, exactly. <laughs> and then uh, scroll down a bit and you'll see Resonator here. You need to put a plus, a, a V here and yes. save below, and then the link will appear on the left menu, just like you saw with Monica. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Shani. This is very important. This is what I learned uh, before. Um, because presumably, I, presumably I, a quicker way, if you just want to look at one page in Resonator, you can also just go directly to the Resonator page. And if you got the queue number from your Wikidata entry, you can enter that in there. And yeah, and exactly. yeah. This is a tool and it's basically just allowing us to explore information in a more visual way, closer to the way that we're used to doing in Wikipedia, 
right? There was almost a, it was a automatically generated entry, just like in the intro to, to an article and then all the different links that Monica showed and below a list of things that are connected to this item, which is really cool and happens only because we have structured linked data. Exactly. So, <clears throat> One interesting thing, for example, I used the, uh, the ID, the Wikidata ID, to find uh, uh, Alexander of Aphrodisias. And as you can see, I find uh, the entry I'm interested in, but not only other entries where, of course, uh, uh, this author is mentioned. So this is very interesting, I think. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, uh, the power of this uh, resource. So, um, Yes, yeah. And I wanted just to mention one thing. Of course, we have other, we have other examples, but uh, uh, one important thing about Wikidata is that you can get uh, more entries than in Wikipedia, of course. This is something that uh, I experimented recently. Uh, as you know, for those of you who follow the Sunoikis, I'm interested in the Deipnos of Isophathenius of Naucratis. We have now in Wikipedia an entry about the characters uh, um, speaking in this uh, work, and this is a list of the characters of this uh, literary work, but we don't have single Wikipedia entries for all these ancient characters because uh, we don't need a specific entry also because we don't have uh, enough information about these authors. But we have entries in Wikidata for these uh, characters, like, for example, uh, Theodorus, as you can see here, we have, we don't have Wikipedia entries for this uh, uh, character of the Deipnosophis. And I had a discussion with the uh, Wikipedia community, which was very, very instructive and useful. So we don't need to add a Wikipedia entry for a character like this, but we need uh, metadata because in any case is a, a character mentioned in an ancient literary work. And uh, we also want to include, for example, the Greek form connecting this. So this lemma is important because we can connect this resource to other uh, li uh, linguistic resources for ancient Greek and through Wikidata, given that we have the lemma, we can of course get more and more uh, metadata about, let's say, an obscure in some way character <laughs> uh, if we compare him to Herodotus, for example. But of course, as you can see, we uh, have uh, metadata and identifiers uh, and um, and other um, information. So just to mention a specific example for, uh, for ancient Greek. So I don't know if... Uh, Monica, I think there are two um, important things to add in this context. If you go back to, to the, um, just a Wikidata item for a second, um, yes. what Monica is talking about is in terms of how we structure the data is critical. We call it modeling. Right, and I think what uh, once we started, first of all, the beginning of Wikidata is very different, just like in the days of Wikipedia. Wikipedia, you know, 20 years ago was very different than it is today. The uh, community that runs it is more mature, and part of this maturity means that we're making an effort to not only bring references to the statements that we add to an item, but we also try to model. Um, items of the same type in a consistent way. Why? Because as we'll see in a second, when we try to then query the database, if the, the information is not structured in the same way, we will not get the, the results that we want or the results are not gonna be inclusive. So one of the tips that I wanna give right now, and we'll discuss it more with Gabby later on when we talk about the assignment that you have, um, is that we want to be very consistent when we uh, actually structure specific items. One way that we're doing it in Wikidata is we organize the um, different items under Wikidata projects. So there is a Wikidata project for ancient Greek um, and ancient Greece or philosophers, etc. And if you're interested, I don't know, in music, there is a Wiki project Wikidata project for music. If you like paintings, there's the Wikidata project for paintings. And one of the things that you'll see on these internal pages of Wikidata 
is that they have a list of properties that we know are like a basic, we need to use these properties to define items from that type, right? So if you're working on a philosopher or on a Greek personality, there would probably be specific items that you want to include when you model a new item. So we just want to uh, you want you to be conscious of that um, when you're doing it. The second uh, note that I wanted to give, and then I think we'll have to move on from the examples to to the rest of it because we're um, yeah. we don't have enough time for all of it. But I'll, I will mention the notability, which is uh, an important thing to understand in comparison to Wikipedia. <clears throat> the notability for Wikipedia is much stricter, as Monica said, right? Less people or items would be on Wikipedia than they are on Wikidata. That doesn't mean, by the way, that everything goes into Wikidata. We have a threshold of notability for Wikidata as well. It's just much lower than Wikipedia. And in essence, as Monica said, there is a place for more things than we can include in Wikipedia than in, in Wikidata. Uh, the comparison is very simple when you look at the numbers, right? If you think of English Wikipedia, which is out of all Wikipedias the biggest, it has roughly 6.5 million uh, articles. Wikidata has 100,000, right? Um, 100 million, sorry, 100 million items. And, uh, and so you see there are much more items on Wikidata than there are on English Wikipedia, which is the largest. Um, last comment, and then we delve right back into the um, into the into the presentation that I prepared because I want to show you some stuff with it. Um, not only how to add information or talking about curating and adding information, which is what Monica uh, talked about, and the specific properties that we choose for for an item. Um, but actually how we extract and what we can do with all of this information that, that is there, which is very cool. Um, we'll get to that in a second. I just wanted to note there is another component uh, when we talk about Wikidata. So we've talked about Q numbers, right? The Q numbers are the identifier, the identifying number for each item in the system. This is what machines can also read. Then there are P numbers. These are the properties, right? The the characteristics or the properties that uh, we will define the item through, right? When the person was born, what type of, of, of entity is it? Uh, what the gender is, when all the list that we saw. And there are also, there's also another um, component in Wikidata in recent years, and that is called Lexims. Uh, Lexims is a <clears throat> relatively new thing. It's important, I'm, I'm mentioning it because I think it's relevant to anyone working in history, linguistics, and, and uh, uh, philosophy where language and specific languages matter. And <clears throat> lexemes will essentially help us capture the true meaning of words. So essentially, it will replace Wiktionary. It will help us be able to translate much more accurately the meaning of words. If you know Google Translate, you'll know that sometimes they get it wrong, right? If it's for English, it's easier. But when you go to smaller languages and to less known languages, it's much worse. And one of the things that drive us and one of the greatest powers of Wikidata is that it, it is multilingual, right? We're able to, through these numbers, have multiple languages attached to a specific item. And the idea is that Lexemes will be, is another entity in the system that is now allowing us to define the specific meaning, the senses of words. And essentially it will help machines do the translation between different languages, especially languages that have fewer uh, people speaking them, fewer contributors, fewer volunteers. So this is essential to preserving the world's knowledge, which is kind of what we all want to do here uh, in these projects. So this is, I'm, I'm closing the parenthesis. We don't have time today to really see Lexims, but I think it's important that you know it exists in the system and is part of the design of Wikidata. Okay, um, going back to my presentation, I want to move to the second part. And uh, because of the time, um, 
I'm, I'm happy that we spent the time seeing some examples. What we didn't really see is how to click on um, an item and actually add, but it's uh, uh, edit it, but it's really quite self-explanatory and quite easy to do. Um, and I'm sure you can do it. We can um, show it in, in the Q&A if people are interested, and if not, you can probably do it alone. I do want to go now to show you some examples of how we extract data and how we visualize. And, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the semantic web idea and linked data. Um, and we said that in a sense, Wikidata is realizing the semantic web dream of Tim Berners-Lee. Well, only partly, right? Because I want to be very clear that Tim Berners-Lee's vision is of a semantic web, right? So in order to have a web, we need different websites operating in the same linked structured way and then that would create that um that layer of data that he's talking about that we can then machine and humans can tap into and query but uh, uh back to to what i wanted to show part of the beauty of the fact that this data set this knowledge base is open it's under open uh, free license of cc0 is that different parties, both external and internal, are using Wikidata to do all sorts of things. And we'll see some examples. That include, by the way, you're, most of you are probably, if you're using Siri and Alexa, you're using Wikidata without knowing because today's uh, digital agents, AI-based agents like Siri and Alexa, when you ask them questions, they will probably bring the answer from Wikidata. So that's the power of structured linked data rather than uh, just a text in Wikipedia. So let's see some examples of what we can do with it. And um, I want to show you some, some external tools uh, that are using Wikidata as a base in order to do some cool visualizations and data extraction. So the first thing I want to show you actually is an example of um, an actual query. I just want you to see how it looks like. So this is a very, very simple query. Uh, let me just go to it. And of course, I didn't mention, but the presentation will be added to the GitHub uh, link later on after, the, after our session. And this is Sparkle. Now, please don't get um, um, anxious because of it. I'm not a programmer. I'm, I, I come from, uh, you know, English, lit and French culture has been my BA, and then I'm an education, um, I'm, I'm an educator. So uh, learning this will require probably an hour and a half, two hours to get the basics. It's not that difficult. Anyone can learn it. But this is basically Sparkle. It's a language. It's a programming language that allows us to query not just Wikidata, but all of the semantic web. And uh, so any website uh, using a semantic web will use Sparkle as the language. And what I've asked here Wikidata to do is very simple. I wanted to see all the women physicists in the world. So this is the query. I'll click on it. I'll run it for a second because I want you to see the results and how it's different from other things. And this is the magic of Wikidata. I wanted women physicists. If I, if I have done it on Google's search, I would have gotten a list of thousands and thousands of websites that mention women and when mentioned physicists, but I would not have gotten a list, an actual list of women physicists. Over 2,500 uh, 2, women to be exact. And one of the powers of this, and this is the query service of Wikidata, uh, we can, you can get to it from the main page of Wikidata from the left menu that Monica showed before. And Essentially, the cool thing is that I can change the visualization quite easily in a click of a button. So a list is awesome, but how about seeing these women? Oh, so we can see it in a, in a grid of just pictures of women that's much more engaging. And even more engaging, I would say, is seeing it in, on a timeline, which Wikidata can help us do. It takes a, a moment to render because it's uh, quite a lot of answers. And in a second, it will come up and you'll see that there is a timeline that I can explore. I can zoom into and out of it and see there is, oh, it crashed. My, my, um, my web page crashed, not Wikidata, not the query service. 
I'll try again. And if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll make sure that you have a, a screenshot in the presentation. But it should go in a second. Let's see if it's, no, it's crashing for me. I don't know why. Probably I have too many things opened. But I'll move to, to a different thing then. I'll, I'll refresh for a second. Uh, sorry about that. Oh, the whole the whole thing crashed. Let me try to open another one. <clears throat> oh, here it is. I'll run it again for a second, and I'll show you another visualizations that that is really important. That is a map, and I really think map uh, seeing things on a map really gives you insight to the data that you can't see without it. So in this case, um, we can see that there's a lot of women physicists here in, in Europe and in America. But is it really true that here in this corner of the world there are no women physicists? In essence, what I'm trying to say is that once you visualize data, you can suddenly interact it in ways that you couldn't before. So visualization is critical to us really gaining insights into the, the, uh, the data. One that we can't, once it was a, a, just a list, I couldn't see it like that, right? But I can, once it's visualized, I can suddenly check, is this red dot really in the sea? Oh no, there's an island here, that makes sense. Okay, that's, that's okay. But if I suddenly see a red spot here in the middle of the sea, I can probably know that uh, someone got the longitude and, and longitude wrong probably. And I can check my data and I can see not only what's here, but also what's missing. And I think that's one of the important things that visualizing data allows us to see is what is not there, what is still missing, what we still need to, to do to curate. And Wikidata is essential in helping us actually do so, some sort of inventory and see what's what we have already and what is missing. Um, I'm going to give a last chance to the... <laughs> timeline to pop up. And if not, we're just going to move on because you'll see it in, in other examples probably. So last chance to see a, <clears throat> a timeline. There are other types of visualizations and you can also download your query results. You can send a link to it to someone or you can download to the, the different results to either Excel spreadsheet or JSON, etc. Um, and it's crashing again. So I'll make sure to capture um, uh, a screenshot for the presentation. And for now, I'm just going to go back because I want to show you a gazillion other things. So let's go back to the presentation. And I wanted to showcase the power, as I said, of having a database that anyone can access and show you Histopedia. Uh, I won't have time to actually go there, but Histopedia is an external website that basically helps us create really nice timelines based on Wikidata and Wikipedia. Here I chose, I think, Italian artists or women art, yeah, Italian Italian painters, and uh, I can visualize it. And it could be, I don't know, from Beatles uh, albums to uh, history, historic wars. To, it could be really any type of discipline. Um, Wikidata encompasses everything in the world, or at least strives to. And so whatever discipline you come from, you'll probably find stuff that you can explore easily. Another important example is that um, this is from the Prado Museum, and the, the same people that created Histopedia actually helped them curate, create this tool of multiple timelines, which I thought is extremely cool. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, uh, I was, there was no internet, the internet just started. And I remember myself sitting down in libraries with tons of books, trying to make sense of who's in which period and which philosopher was with the same musician, with, with the same architect. So I can have a, a good, ex, uh, like I could make sense of historical figures. And suddenly here with a click of a button, almost because we have structured linked data, we can suddenly see these things and we can see and learn things in context. So here the Prado Museum, one of the biggest in, in Spain, uh, in Madrid, is allowing us to see the different items in the collection in context. And you can actually choose, I chose here music and paintings, 
but you can actually choose from different things that are interesting to you and learn about these things in the context of other things that happened in, in that period, which I think is really cool. Um, moving on, I wanted to talk because this is, um, we're also coming from academia. Uh, so I wanted to talk about Wikisite, which is a, an internal projects that we have uh, that basically, <coughs> sorry about that, that basically wants to make sure that all the academic articles are structured in Wikidata well. Why is it important? I want to show it to you through Scolia, which is another tool built um, upon Wikidata. And let's just explore one, one person on Scolia just to see how it looks like. So if any one of you know, um, if, if you know, I'll, I'll give you an example of actually of Tim Berners-Lee. We've mentioned him. Why not? Let's see how he how he looks like in in Scolia. So Scolia is a bit like Google Scholar, I think, but from my from my uh, perspective, a bit better. So uh, we will see an intro from the English Wikipedia, and then different things about him, about his academic work. Uh, this is a list of publication. Then below it, you can see a number of publications per year pages per year, you can see the topics that he's working on. So he's obviously written a lot about the semantic web, linked data, open data, etc. He is the author of um, these works. You can see really a topic metrics and you can see where he published. And one of the coolest things that I love, you can see his collaborators. So this is the co-author graph. So this is actually, this is a live thingy. So this is allowing us to see who he collaborates with and how this system of researchers are connected to one another and working together. So, and the cool thing is, and it goes on and on, you can see it on a map, you can see it on a timeline. Um, the cool thing is that every section that you saw here is coming from a Wikidata query and it's um, being rendered in real time. So if suddenly Tim Berners-Lee's who, who's actually alive and, and kicking and still doing amazing things, if he suddenly writes another academic article and I edit, when I click on it, I'll see the updated uh, list, including the new articles. So this is a live query running. I can look at the query if I want and tweak things in it and run it if I want. But Scolia will allow you to do all that and see all of these things about any author, any academic, um, and it's not only for academics, it's also for works, organizations, locations, et cetera. So you can explore Scolia by yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm going to skip that and move to some examples because of the time. And we also wanted to show you some, some more um, projects from around the world. That now that you see how a query looks like and what how we can extract information and visualize it, and you've seen that we have external tools like Histopedia and Scolia who are helping us visualize the data that we extract from Wikidata. I wanted to show you what different people in the world are doing with Wikidata. So some notable projects from around the world. And <clears throat> the first example I want to give is of the Astrolabe Explorer. This is coming from the University of Oxford in the UK. And uh, we had a Wikimedian in residence in that university, in the in the Bodleian Libraries for four years, Dr. Martin Poulter. And one of the things that Martin wanted to do when he was there was it was some sort of a proof of concept, right? He built a website. Uh, the, there's a, a wonderful collection of astrolabes, right? These are uh, ancient devices that help us navigate. Uh, and all of them are almost like um, art. A every astrolabe is not only a... a a piece of machinery, right? It's it's mechanic. It has mechanic abilities, but it's also very, very beautifully um, done. And there's a huge collection of astrolabes that was in one of the museums uh, in Oxford. And they wanted to make it accessible because no one had access to it. So what they did is they basically imported all the metadata into Wikidata. 
And suddenly, when they had it on Wikidata, Martin was able to build this website during, I think it was a lunchtime, right? And this is, again, was a proof of concept showing that whatever collection you have, it doesn't matter what the topic is, if it's astrolabes or books or whatever, albums, uh, it could really be cards, it could really be anything in any discipline, uh, you can create, and these are, again, auto-generated timelines, location, so there's a tab of a map, all of the things that you see here are automatically or rather automatically generated through Wikidata um, because we have the data there. And because it's there, other um, people from the world can contribute their own astrolabes from their own collection. So suddenly we have a global database that holds information about astrolabes and we can see and explore them in new, more engaging ways. So this is the example. Another example from the UK, uh, this time from the University of Edinburgh, um, they did a wonderful project. Um, and there's a link here for the actual project and to an article about it if you're interested in it. But they wanted to explore the 16th and 17th century Scottish witch hunts. Or rather, they already had a really high quality academic uh, database. And it was about to be shut down because they didn't have, I think, the resources to keep it going, which happens a lot in academia, right? You'll have scholars working on something and the database sits somewhere and no one has the money to keep maintaining it. What they did is, again, they took the data, uh, which was really um, high quality and moved it to, imported it into Wikidata, added Lang, uh, added coordinates for the places, so rather match the old places, uh, the old names of the, the places and the towns to the actual uh, current names. And they were able to create this amazing website that is really interactive and completely changed the way that we can interact with this um, historic thing. And it, it really made a lot of lots of waves in, in the, it, this project won prizes. It, inspired some additional projects uh, because it's so cool and really engaged people to know about their local history. And um, people donated additional uh, uh, information that wasn't uh, available to the database. So it really uh, was a wonderful way to engage the public again in, in this. And once you put it on um, like an open global data set, database like Wikidata, you can do much more than if it's closed and non accessible. Okay, I want to move on, but I'm checking the time for a second. Uh, we're a bit late, so I'm going to pause to see with my colleagues if we can uh, take some more minutes to, to show some more examples um, instead of the QA. What, what do you say? Would it be, um, would it be worth jumping to? Um, talking a little bit about editing, at least for a little bit, um, without going into detail in the Q&A. Um, uh, um, um, I think it's, um, I, I do want to show some some few things, mm -hmm. and then we can go back to editing. Okay. I'll be, I'll be very quick. I just want to show some of the capabilities that Wikidata has. Perfect. Um, Okay, so I'll take just a few more minutes to jump through uh, a few more examples and then we'll move to the Q&A and, and summing up. So uh, this is an example from the Met and the Met uh, basically released many, many of their items. I, I'm talking about thousands of items. They have an open access policy. And one of the things that you see here is a query about items on, on the... Um, Met's collection that they imported into Wikidata. And in the middle here is a portrait of Madame X, which is a really well-known painting. Now, again, if you know museums, you'll know that curators of uh, exhibitions usually know all that there is to know about their items. But this query helped unravel connections and relationships that were unknown in this specific case, that the portrait of Madame X actually inspired a design of a black dress that was um, worn by Rita Hayworth in the film Gilda. Uh, it's really interesting, this example, because that piece of information was unknown to the curator. And that is, again, the power of linked open data is that we're once we're structuring data, 
it is, and then querying it, we can suddenly see or unravel connection and relationships that we didn't know about before. Um, Wikidata is also helping us track the completeness. And this is, uh, this is the dashboard of the Met. This is using a tool called, called Integrality to help us really see the amount of um, a percentage that uh, of paintings, sculptures, drawing, all the different pieces of, of um, items that they've donated and how complete it is. Again, this is completely automatically generated and would be a nightmare to do without Wikidata, but this tool is allowing us to see the completeness and track it. Um, a final um, a example from the Met is this game. Um, this is something that I think is really cool because it's, again, allowing us to involve the public. Even small kids can play this game. All it does is showing you a picture and asking you to say, is there a tree, yes or no, or skip if you're not sure. But if you say, yes, there is a tree here, there's a statement written behind the scenes into Wikidata. So this is a, an opportunity to do what we call micro contributions uh, by the public, helping uh, the, when the public can help us curate information about the pictures. And once we have this information, we can start asking all sorts of questions that before we couldn't even ask about paintings or, or, whatever it, or whatever it is. Last example, I do want to mention that we're using Wikidata to actually auto-generate content. And here you can see that um, a, but we're doing it not only for Wikibooks, uh, but also for um, actual articles on Wikipedia. Think of smaller Wikipedias with less volunteers or less people talking the language. And it's really important that using the data that we have on Wikidata, we will be able to at least give them a skeleton of, a, of an article. And then humans, volunteers can come and add information, but we will have some structure coming from the data that already exists. This is a game changer and especially important for smaller languages. Um, I wanted to show, you can explore this uh, presentation to see a bit more examples especially of creating new digital objects that didn't exist before and exist only now when we curate information and query it and can visualize it. And I wanted to, to talk about the Burnt Museum and how we did some sort of data archaeology to reconstruct uh, items from that, um, from that museum uh, through Wikidata. But again, if you're interested in that, um, you can um, ask us and uh, we can share more. Wikidata was also critical during COVID to help us curate everything, all the data um, with references. You can see here a list of all the cities in the world and how many cases uh, we had deaths recovered, et cetera, and all the references that we have, and also visualizing different things about the pandemic. So it was a really crucial moment where Without the global community of Wikidata, it was it would have been much difficult to much more difficult to curate. Lastly, I want to say that we're using Wikidata in academia, um, both um, just adding it as an alternative assessment in, in courses or as the main topic, um, which is what I've been doing at Tel Aviv University. I've created a course in 2018 uh, that is called From Web 2 to Web 3, from Wikipedia to Wikidata. These are my the students of the first round. And it's really crucial because uh, we've been using Wikipedia in the classroom as, as a way to give assignments um, for a long time now. But, and it's, we know that it's improving all sorts of skills. What Wikidata is allowing us to explore now is data literacy, that's the new thing. And um, the students really like it as well. And this course has won prizes, but I wanna sum up and get to the Q and A. So I think what we've shown you today is that there's a, a huge potential in, and benefits to working in a linked open way. It's helping us connect different databases that weren't connected before, allow us to ask questions that we couldn't before, it was very difficult to understand, visualize information, tell stories with data that we couldn't before, help curate work and follow the completeness, et cetera. Um, it's also the basic, the basis for different applications, like we saw Histopedia and Scolia, there are others, and the basis for AI. 
And all in all, we know from research that it, it helps engaging with this platform helps improve critical thinking and analysis um, uh, for both curating and extracting information. And all in all, it's helping us fighting fake, fake news and improve our data literacy. Uh, I, I will pause here because I also think it's important to talk about the challenges, and there are many, just like in Wikipedia, there's always an issue of data reliability. How do we verify data? How do we know it's not manipulated? How can we track that it's complete? There are gaps of, and how do we make sure that the modeling is, is done well and properly? Um, this is all requiring skills, critical, critical thinking, different digital abilities. And I want to pause here um, to talk a bit about that with Gabby and Monica. Uh, but just to say that from my perspective, all these challenges are opportunities. The, we are living in a really interesting period of time where AI is on the rise, where data is accessible to us in new ways. I will share that the platform that Wikidata is uh, built upon, it's called Wikibase. And now uh, part of what we're doing in the Wikimedia movement is uh, help different organizations set up their own Wikibase, just like different uh, people can open their own Wikipedia, uh, not exactly Wikipedia, but they can open their own Wiki based on MediaWiki, that's the, the platform. So Wikibase is the technological platform upon which Wikidata is operating. And there's a new sister project that is even enhancing more. I'll pause here if you want to know more about Wiki functions and Wiki Lambda. There are different um, separate um, um, YouTube videos where you can hear more about that. But this is the time to for Q and A. So I'm leaving my presentation and going back to the main room to discuss it a bit with my colleagues. Thank you, Shelley, um, and thank you, Monica. That, that's um, really um, uh, impressive to have managed to introduce such a big topic um, so so quickly. And I know we, we've overrun a little bit, which was partly um, partly my fault um, for, for asking questions earlier. But um, but 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 there's a lot a lot in there. And, and um, as, yes, it's um, an as, ecosystem. It yeah. really is a yeah. an ecosystem in itself, and it takes time to learn the the language and learn how to behave there just like in in wikipedia but it's but it's exciting yeah, yeah. and when, when we first approached you about um about this session shani um i remember you know we said so we'll, we'll try and get through this in an hour and you say you know i have trouble getting through this in 20 hours you know when i'm teaching it in a course so you know yes. it is it is it is you know um it, there's a lot to, to go into that. that's great mm -hmm. um so um so please anyone watching if you do have questions or comments please do um um, we've got less time for questions than we would normally, but 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 please do feel free to ask questions in the comments. We have one question um, which we I think we partly addressed already, and and unfortunately, um, that Joanna Chavedo has had to has had to leave, but he will probably be watching this asynchronously. Mm -hmm. So if we answer it, answer and have anything more to add now, he will he will he will get the answer eventually. Um, but he's asking about the relationship between search engines and specifically the Wikidata URIs. Um, so let me see that I understand the question. Is there any relationship between search engines? Search engines, you mean Google? Or I assume is, you mean is that the, is that the question? And other, and other um, Juan, if you're, if you're here, and let us know if we're understanding you correctly. Um, he's, in he's any not, case, he's already, he's already left. oh, he's gone. Yeah. So I will say this uh, on, on that question. I can tell you that uh, the opposite is happening, or rather, um, Google and many other big um, players in the internet today are using Wikidata and are, are extracting information from this database to their own needs. Sometimes Google is actually also trying to create its own knowledge graph. So for instance, when you try to, I don't know, if you um, uh, put in a Google search um, uh, a currency, right? Uh, can you can you tell me how much a hundred dollars in um, uh, in in pounds? Or if you want to know um, to do a time shift, or if you ask specific questions like that, you'll see a a square of sort or a rectangle with an answer. This is actually coming 
and with an exact answer, right? This is coming from Google's knowledge graph and they're extracting information and also building up on their own database of, of facts, uh, similarly to what we're doing in Wikidata. The thing is, um, this is closed, right? We have no access to that uh, database. I want people to understand the difference. The beauty of Wikidata is that we can all go there and update if there is a mistake. We can see how the information is structured and we can change it and correct it. Other than that, um, usually AI agents that are able to, again, query Wikidata will extract information like Siri and Alexa. So uh, it's a bit different than usual Web2 search, but it is queried by machines, which is awesome. Which is, it's, it's, also, it's also a bit opaque, isn't it? Because um, while Wiki, Wikidata is, is entirely open, as you, as you said, and they can get data from there, we don't necessarily know that that's where they've got data from because they don't tell us, right? Um, so you don't get, um, if you ask a question and the answer is Douglas Adams, they'll tell you the answer is Douglas Adams, but they won't give you a link to the Wikidata URI, even if that's where they got it from. Um, so they might they might yeah. give you a link to the Wikipedia page because that's that's also in their, in their top searches, but... Interestingly, uh, I, I can share a really in parentheses because it's not really related, but I will say that we're actually right now in the Wikimedia, Wikimedia movement um, in a very exciting period of choosing a sound logo for Wikipedia and Wikimedia projects. So actually, when you do speak to your smartphone and you get an answer that comes from Wikidata or Wikipedia, there will be some kind of sound that tells you, oh, this is from this website and it, it will help. So yeah. we're, we're trying to work on, on people yeah. knowing yeah. where the information comes yeah. from. But I yeah. think it, it, it goes to a deeper question, right, of how do we know where the information comes from? Um, how do we verify it? And in a sense, everything that we're doing in Wikipedia to, um, to help monitor the data, the, the information is happening uh, a bit differently, but also uh, in, in Wikidata. We also have bots and machines helping us follow the, the data, but it takes a, a huge amount of volunteers. We have over 25,000 volunteers worldwide monitoring the data and it because it's so big it's it's a tough job and uh, we're doing it with much love and i see a question from marja I'm, I'm hoping i'm um, pronouncing your name correctly um, and you're asking if there's a way to track the coverage meaning how do i know when and by whom data was being entered yes you can uh, so when you um just like in wikipedia one of our key things on every wiki project in the Wikimedia movement is transparency. Everything that happens is, in a sense, written down into the system. And if, I don't know if, um, if um, Monica, can you share your screen and maybe show what I'm saying? But um, in essence, uh, even in Wikipedia, there is a history uh, um, tab most of us simply don't see it because we we ignore it, right? We just go to the to the details that we want in the article and go go out. But yes, you can you can see every line here. Monica, can you uh, enlarge just a bit? Yes, sorry, I had to. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I lost because I had my micro off. So okay, this is uh, for example. Perfect. History, this yeah. is the history of that article. Um, the the uh, here we're in Wikipedia, but even if you go to Wikidata, and by the way, uh, yes, this is what I wanted to show. There's a link on the left menu on Wikipedia to click to move to the Wikidata item of it. It's not a significant. Uh, uh, give me a second that I go to a bigger. Um, okay, yeah. history. Herodotus is is fine. Okay. And okay. you can look at view history and basically, essentially, every line that you see here is an edit that was made to the page, to the item. And you can see when it was made. Here we can see that it's plus 343 three, uh, bytes were, edit, were added to it. And usually it will show you what type of thing happened here. So here they created a claim. They added a statement about about it and you can uh you there's an, a thank you uh, button and, a, and also an undo so if someone is corrupting um or um 
putting in information that is incorrect or just trying to, to vandalize the site, which happens sometimes, but not a lot, um, then we can undo that specific edit and revert it to the previous um, round. But essentially, yes, and the cool thing is that you can compare. Monica is going to the, to the right thing. The system allows us to compare any two um, versions that we want. We can choose whichever we want. And here we can see that he, uh, they added a property, um, um, 376, and I, I can't see, it's too small for me, but it, it will tell you what it is and you can click on it, et cetera, and check actually that the change is made to the item, especially if it's an item that you're following and is interesting to you, you can see what's happening with it and you can see um, whether or not uh, someone changed and it's correct. And references is the name of the game, right? A good item, any statement that you add, add a reference to where you brought the data from, which is essential to making sure that uh, we have a high quality, um, you know, knowledge base. And if you see a, a reference missing, add one. It's a, it's really easy. So Monica, uh, uh, considering what Gabby wanted, can you go back to the item? Just click on the item. Uh, um, yeah. uh, yep. uh, read, yes, of course. So near the discussion or read, yes. Yeah. So you see here that, first of all, if you're going into an item and there's something missing, a label is missing or a description is missing from a language that you speak, you can click here right where Monica is showing on the edit. And this is editable. You simply add something and you click on publish and it's there. And then when you want to add statements, cancel it for now because we don't want to, add, unless you do want to add something. No, okay. So, okay. Yeah. so th this is the edit for the section of the languages and labels. But for the statements themselves, if I want to add another value, let's say it's not only an instance of a human, but I don't know, uh, an instance of something additional, I can edit like this. So I click on the pencil mark, and then I would um, simply publish and it will be there. Le uh, and there's, uh, wait, wait, uh, can you scroll? Uh, yes. If you click on the references, you can see, yes, that you can actually see the actual reference and you can add a reference if you want to, if, if there is none. Again, click on the plus, it will allow you, the system actually, because it already knows that it's a, an instance of human, and this is a picture, it will automatically ask you for specific properties that are missing for you to fill in the, the value. Um, sometimes it works. There are also, if you're just starting out, there are different tools like Cradle that allow you to give you some sort of like a form to fill out, which is easier a bit for beginners. But I think just delving into the system and seeing where things are, uh, is great. Um, if you want to add another statement that is not there, you can go completely down. Oh, here, here, uh, um, Monica is adding that he was a geographer. Well, um, it was what we had in uh, Resonator. So yes, so you can publish. And ideally, when Monica does this statement, she also adds a reference directly, right? So she will click on add a reference and bring, I don't know, maybe a URL um, and or something that uh, tells people where she brought it from. We'll cancel for now. And I just wanted to show you that if you want to add another property, another statement that basically is not there, you'll have to scroll to the end of the current statements. It's a bit tricky, this one. So scroll down until you get to the identifiers section to external links. And then let's see where it is. Oh, oh here. So here, just above, you, you'll have just before the identifiers uh, section, which is, again, the external databases, you will have the ability to add another statement and see what additional property that is still not there is missing. Um, now, Herodotus is quite elaborate as it is because it's a well-known figure, but when you go to less known things, you can have items with nothing, with no statements. Then the basic thing to do is first make sure there's a good label and a description 
in English and in your additional languages that you speak. Then add, um, if it's a human or if it's a book or if it's a, a place, just enter the instance of, which I know takes some getting used to, but it's really important, for instance, to know that Herodotus is an instance of human and not, for, for example, a fictional character, yeah. right? Because then when I want all the philosophers that are humans, I can tell Wikidata, go to the database and look for all the humans that are philosophers and he will appear in that list. Um, one thing, interesting thing for, for, uh, for example, for, for us ancient historians, when you work on an entry about Herodotus, um, sorry, I have to go back to, but for example, these parts are a bit critical, but we have, so for example, when you are, have to write the occupation or also the chronology, these are modern categories. Uh, of course, th these are a bit difficult for us, uh, but still, uh, this is important because we have a big structure. We have to use these general categories. And in any case, we can also add data about ancient authors. Of course, there are complexities, for example, for the chronology, place of birth, date of death, or also uh, country of citizenship, uh, yeah. which is a modern category for an ancient uh, author is a bit tricky, but still. So this is where we have to learn how to use these resources, because in any case, we have to use this structure. We can't just add our specific, I mean, uh, assertion of specific for ancient authors. And in any case, there is a, um, we have a lot of possibilities to add um, correct data about ancient, uh, the ancient world, where we have many complexities, a lot of missing data, ambiguities, and so on. So, but in Monica, any case, yeah. Yeah, Monica is absolutely right that modeling is um, essentially like when you know what you're doing and you already know what you want to structure, it's very easy to do. You, you saw it's a click of a button and it's there, but yeah. it actually takes uh, some time and some thought Yes. to structure the, the data, to model it correctly, to make sure that it's consistent. And uh, it's a good time to mention again that there is a community of Wikidatans around the world that will be happy to help you. You can connect either by asking on the um, uh, website itself, there's a portal for the community, but also if you're on Facebook, for instance, uh, there is a Wikidata community group that you can go and uh, ask questions in, especially if you're a beginner. If you're trying out a query and you don't succeed at the beginning, that's okay. Again, people will help you fine tune. There's a, I didn't mention, but in the query service itself, there are 400 examples that you can explore and tweak it, to tweak the Q number and the P number to, to get whatever you want. So again, we know it's a lot. We know it's, we've bombarded you with quite a lot of inform, new information, but once you start and try it, uh, you'll see it's not that complex, actually, unlike writing a whole Wikipedia article, which could be really complex. Adding information is not that difficult. And then querying requires a bit more. And hopefully in the future, we can have sessions for how to query their different resources. If that's interesting to you, contact us and we can send you more resources. But uh, I think with that, um, I'm, <clears throat> I want to thank you for staying with us and um, you know, hearing hearing us and seeing all the examples, I, we know it's a lot, but we hope that we gave you a really a rich understanding of what is even possible and why it's important that we have this knowledge base and it's available to everyone. So it's a resource you can use and can contribute to. And um, we look forward to seeing what you what you do with it. Maybe Gabby wants to share some more about the specific um, assignment that you want to give the participants? Well, I was, I mean, yes, I was actually just going to say if um, if anyone watching is keen to try to try this out, to try out editing, but they're not quite sure what to, what to, to edit, um, one place um, where, um, where I, would, I would start would just be to look at the name, the very first thing at the very top, the name, if you click below the, the, the three or four selected languages that it gives you for your region or for your, uh, for your own um, uh, identified language proficiency in your account or whatever reason it gives you those languages, um, 
if you click below that to see it in all languages, um, if there's a language you speak or write that is missing from that list, you can add um, the name in that language. Um, or even if it's not missing, if it's not the only possible spelling in that language. So, for example, if we're talking about an ancient Greek character, we had Ale Alexandros of Aphrodisias was the was given as the English name. Now, I've never heard anyone call him Alexandros of Aphrodisias, and you know I'm a classicist and we're pretty pedantic. It's Alexander of Aphrodisias almost always. So you can put that as an alias in the, in, in the um, in there as well and i'm sure the same is true in many other languages where you can you know there might be two or three different ways to write their name i mean it helps if you if you can you know if you can uh, attest that you've got that from somewhere um but um but that's that's a very simple thing you, you need to do and i think to put in um aliases you don't you don't need a citation you don't need a reference um so um you know if you make something up someone will delete it but um but it's um but that, that, that's, that's a place to start. And so you can see how it works. You know, you're simply just opening a field, typing something, putting in a, a property and a, and a value. And, and once you've done that a few times, you'll start to see, you'll start to spot other things that, um, that you know, but actually we know who Alex, Alexander of Aphrodisus' father was. Um, so you can add, you know, you can figure out how to add that. Um, I tried to add it earlier, couldn't quite figure it out. So maybe someone else can figure it out. Um, another so, yeah. really, Another really quick thing that um, participants can do any one of you is, I'm, I'm assuming most of you are exploring Wikipedia articles. Uh, when you're on a Wikipedia article, you've just re read it and it's fresh in your minds. And a nice thing to do would be to click on the left menu where Monica showed you. There's a link to the Wikidata item and just check. Is there anything, any detail that you can add from the uh, information that you read in a structured way, some some facts about that personality, and that can also help um, make the database richer and more accurate. And for classicists, in my experience, there is a, an active community of classicists, for example, for identifiers of ancient authors. I have been adding many uh, identifiers, and uh, I made a few times a mistake in the sense that there were other entries with the same identifier, but immediately the community responded and helped me to merge those identifiers. So everything is correct, because of course with identifiers you can get crazy. So by experience, I can say that there is an active community uh, and uh, of classes of people who um, has experience in the field. So this is a really wonderful aim. I think. L last thing maybe to um, notify the, the participants. Uh, first, if you um, are doing the assignments, please um, log into the dashboard so we can track you and we can help you if you need. And But most importantly, what I wanted to say is not the dashboard, is that you need to know that it's very easy to open new items on Wikidata. Please, before you do that, make a good search in the search box in, in Wikidata just to make sure that the item that you want uh, is not already there. And maybe you just didn't find it. a different name, yeah. Yes, maybe it could be. A, so Wikidata has a really good search. Uh, it will show you if it doesn't. If it doesn't exist, you can create it. Uh, and it's quite easy. There's All you need is to add a name. And I think that's it. Yeah. And uh, and the item is created. Then you can add statements, etc. Uh, you do need to know that then properties you cannot add automatically, right? It, it, the community actually discusses there is a limited number of properties that uh, are available. And if, you, if the property that you want is missing, it doesn't exist, then you will have to discuss it with the community in the right place on Wiki, on Wikidata in order to get your proper, the new property set up and then you can use it. So if that happens, talk to us and we can help you. But just know you can't open new properties, just new items. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. And we hope to see you on Wiki. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's, so as far as I know, there are no students who are following this, um, this session in, in December 2022 for credit, um, at least not mm -hmm. with us. But there, there may well be in the future. Yeah. Um, and and they, if, if you are following this um, in, in the future, in our future, not in your future, um, if, if, um, for, for, for credit with, with either Monica or myself or, or, or indeed Chani, we will, we will give you more information about how to find that dashboard. We'll give you more information about the, the project. And if you're doing this for credit with, with someone else, they will also give you more, more information on, 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 on all of that. If you're following this, um, you know, uh, 
independently, um, then um, then use all of these resources. Um, there's all sorts of um, you know forums and communities of people who who are you know interested in this sort of thing that, that you can easily find. Um, and if you get really stuck, then feel free to, to get in touch with us. I think we'd, we'd we'd all be very happy to you know to make sure this sort of thing is used and done. So um, so that's. Um, that's very cool. So we have um, we have gone we have gone over time, um, which is always a good sign because um, <laughs> it's um, you know it, it's it's an excellent topic and um, you know we could we could easily have gone on for another three hours, right? But don't, don't worry, we're not going to. Um, but um, thank you, thank you, um, thank you very much again, Shani and Monica, um, and to um, to all of you who were who were watching live. And um, this was the last Sonoicus DC session for this semester and for this year. Um, but there will be more coming in January, so watch the usual space for announcements of that very soon. We'll, um, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much. <laughs>